Let's talk about core beliefs, sometimes called core fears, stuck points, or unmet needs, depending on the theory. Common negative core beliefs are in four categories. First category is helplessness, which are beliefs like, I'm weak, I'm a loser, I'm trapped. The second category is unlovability, which is stuff like, I'm going to end up alone and no one likes me, I'm invisible or ignorable. The third category is worthlessness, and that's, I am bad, I don't deserve. The fourth category is external danger. Others can't be trusted, nothing ever goes right, the world is dangerous. The unconscious core belief of I'm not acceptable underpins the single person who never has a good date because they never bring themselves to the actual date, or they're too preoccupied with managing their fear and they build up walls or they create impossible tests or standards or make negative assumptions. The unconscious core belief of power keeps you safe and vulnerability makes you a target might drive the rageaholic Vietnam vet who screams at his son when he strikes out at baseball. Core beliefs can sometimes form from experiences like neglect or abuse, bullying, etc. That's called trauma. They can sometimes come from the biology of a highly sensitive or rigid, easily conditionable temperament and life with regular bumps and bruises. If someone experiences a lot of failure or powerlessness, especially if it's overvalued or catastrophized, that commonly leads to a core belief of helplessness and hopelessness. They think there's nothing they can do to change their circumstances. These people may be considered lazy or self-sabotaging by an outsider, but they're plagued by a core belief that whispers, why even try? The chronic overeaters and overspenders, the ones who stay in bad relationships, the high school kids who start skipping classes and drinking, probably core belief of hopelessness and helplessness. Let's talk about thoughts. Thoughts are automatic and just pop in your head because of electricity in the brain. When thoughts are believed as true or given power and meaning, instead of just being considered a thought, they can reinforce core beliefs. They can also pop into your head more fiercely and frequently as a result of core beliefs. Split-second thoughts cannot be changed. You can notice your thoughts or add alternative thoughts intentionally. It's possible that X, Y, and Z is true, but the split-second thoughts that pop into your head, they're going to pop into your head. Now let's talk about emotions. Emotions are your interpretations of your physiology, often thoughts, but sometimes just perceived meaning. Your heart racing and sweating, you might interpret that as excitement or fear or just that you're running. That warm sinking feeling in your stomach, maybe grief, maybe nervousness, maybe disappointed because you just lost a game, maybe excited to go down a water slide. You guessed it. Perceptions of emotions rely heavily on thoughts and core beliefs. If I'm on a date and the guy I like smirks, my core belief of I am unacceptable leads me to think that he's annoyed and therefore I interpret my sinking stomach as disappointing. If my core belief is I am enough, I might think he's actually flirting with me and I'll interpret excited butterflies in my stomach. The emotion I feel from a sibling cruelly pouring ice water on my head is tight and angry because I believe and think my sibling's being cruel. The emotion I feel when I give myself the ice bucket challenge is proud and connected, even though my physiology is experiencing the exact same thing. When I go for a run, my thoughts and beliefs make me interpret my heart pounding as stability and vitality. My interpretation is different when my heart pounds when a car just swerved in front of me. That I perceive as fear. Split second emotions are impossible to directly change just like thoughts. When people try to change their emotions directly, it makes it worse a lot of the times. They need to address their thoughts first. But as I said, that's hard to do and has to be done after the fact by intentionally adding other possibilities. Maybe this is true, maybe this is true, maybe this, maybe this. That leads me to behaviors. Behaviors stem from beliefs, thoughts, and emotions, and they also influence beliefs, thoughts, and emotions as well. They have an automatic direct dial on emotions though, big time. And if you use behaviors very intentionally, behaviors can have a direct dial on thoughts as well. If you want to make a change, behaviors are a heck of a lot easier to start with than thoughts and emotions. And I don't mean, and I don't mean just change already. Overeater, stop eating. Over controlling with your kids, just stop it. And while you're at it, just be more open and charismatic and trusting on dates. Absolutely not, not realistic. What needs to happen is people need to identify their core beliefs and change a behavior that proves that core belief wrong. And it should be a behavior that you have total control over that doesn't depend on anything external. Maybe the overeater carries around a core belief that they are unworthy and undeserving. Maybe the person that yells at their kids has a core belief that powerlessness makes you weak and in danger. Maybe the kids stop doing their homework because they feel hopeless and helpless to conquer this algebra. 
In each of those situations, the people need to identify what their actual core belief is and choose very intentional and realistic behaviors that go contrary to those beliefs. Core belief that you're worthless? Where can you be worthwhile? Where can you make a tiny difference and how can you divert your thoughts after the fact to recognize doing so? Core belief that you're helpless and impotent leading to a reactive rage problem or nitpicking every dang thing and judging everything in a socially insufferable way? Experiment with behaviors that are not helpless and impotent i.e. appropriate assertiveness, which is a big part of a lot of therapy, asking for what you want, and then direct your thoughts to recognize, look what I did, look at the power that I actually had. Usually the behaviors that are real life, inescapable, undeniable contradictions of your negative core beliefs snowball, especially if you intentionally add thoughts that align with your new belief and what you're observing to be different than your old core belief. Soon, the person who's treating herself as worthy enough to prepare her own meals, even when it means telling her child to wait 10 minutes before she can help him, becomes the woman who practices validating her internal feelings instead of shaming herself. Eventually, she finds herself generally allowing feelings to come up inside of her instead of reactively numbing them with food. So eventually, that woman, because she started treating herself as someone who is worthy, stops overeating. All right, let's talk about really rotten, horrible feelings, objectable, condemnable emotions and urges. This occurs to me as important because I just read a book by Edith Eager, the Jewish psychologist who survived Auschwitz. While maintaining acute awareness and curiosities of her own emotions as she was attempting to heal her own trauma, Dr. Eager was also treating real humans in therapy. Real humans who, although they were obviously not as destructive as Hitler, held beliefs and thus emotions that could be incredibly dangerous to others. While investigating her own relationship with powerless and revenge and her own core beliefs, Dr. Eager worked with a rageaholic father who came back from Vietnam, his whole platoon dead because he obeyed orders. And that man came back with a core belief that the only thing that keeps us safe is fierce, independent-minded force. Dr. Eager stood in her office one time with a husband who just found out his wife cheated with his friend. And that man was brandishing a gun and vowing to murder them both. Dr. Eager sat across a white supremacist, her, a concentration camp survivor, listening to him spit his disgust, his vitriol toward non-whites. That man eventually pinpointing his core belief that redemption from worthlessness only comes from squashing others' humanity. Dr. Eager hated Hitler for heartlessly torturing millions, for murdering so many innocents, including her own parents, and her first and only at the time love. But she actually did talk about forgiving him. Using a definition of forgiveness, to me more like accepting that he was, and there's nothing she could do to change it, and committing to spending no more internal energy on hating him because it diminished her life to spend that energy on it. The healthy kind of forgiveness that has nothing to do with letting the other person off the hook. Then Dr. Eager simply wanted to figure out how to understand and how to challenge what was in Hitler and what seemed to be accessible to regular humans everywhere, even to herself and her friends who engaged in fantasies about murdering the Nazis understandably. So Dr. Eager's psychological training was back in the 1960s when cognitive behavioral therapy was very popular. It still is very popular because it's effective. So what you do is you find and you soften that core belief and that will root out the source of the psychological problem. Try to reduce the anger, the envy, the disgust, the objectively dangerous emotion directly, risk heightening it. The only thing to do, Dr. Eager concluded, was make room for that horrific emotion to exist even alongside other feelings, find the core belief that it serves and soften the core belief with intentional thoughts and experiences. So she let the gun wielding guy rage about his wife for a moment and open herself up to hearing him. But she knew she needed to contain this. Not having time to find his core belief in that moment, she decided on a Hail Mary to dilute his hatred with love. She talked about his children. It actually worked a little. Eventually, they did get to his core fear of, I am unlovable, and destroying the evidence, destroying my wife who cheated on me, will make it not true that I'm not lovable. With a rageaholic dad from Vietnam, she remembered hopelessness and helplessness, and assumed that with his catastrophic war history, this had something to do with his core belief. So, she threw in some hope and help to soften that hopelessness and helplessness. You can be the man that your wife and kids are proud of. The man sitting here showing who he really is, showing his soft underbelly, that's who they want. And that's who you're becoming with these conversations. Hitler, the Nazis, and much of Germany were reeling with hopelessness and helplessness and inadequacy and all kinds of stuck points after the Treaty of Versailles weakened them. 
and they fell for a dangerous mental trick that happens when pain is met with a belief that promises a quick fix. When humans or when countries are feeling painfully impotent and powerless and hopeless, dangerous core beliefs are very tempting. Humans do this all the time. Mm -hmm. I worked with a childhood neglect victim imprisoned for drowning her own child in a bathtub. Eventually, she discerned that her core belief that she walked around with was that she was invisible and she was so pained by her boyfriend ignoring her and attending to the child that she fell for that incredibly dangerous mental trick. Of course, this is the extreme psychopathy of an extreme delusion that the pain we carry can somehow be erased, but we are all capable of diluting ourselves similarly. Consider spanking a child during a moment of powerlessness. It's an example of this delusion that our powerlessness might be assuaged with force without consequence, a delusion. My opinion is we need to be very suspicious of quick fixes that promise freedom from our own powerlessness, helplessness, worthlessness, Something like, if I criticize my kid enough on the football field, that will assuage my powerlessness and equip him to being empowered in a way that will keep him safe. Kill my cheating wife, I will erase this worthlessness since she is the source of the worthlessness. If I hate others, I will be bright because they are in my shadow. Or even something like, lockdowns and mandates will truly protect us from our impotence and vulnerability without consequence. These are simplistic lies. These are simplistic answers, and a lot of times they are lies that we all need to be aware of. The lies of automatic beliefs that are not just relegated to monsters, but befall us all. So if we have learned anything from the atrocities of the world, or even from the atrocities of individual relationships and families, I think it's that we need to be more aware of our core beliefs, that we are so meaningfully powerless, or so inadequate, or invisible, or worthless, that force is justified reactively to allow escape from that feeling. Instead, I encourage us all to expand our willingness to at times feel our pain, stay with it solemnly and patiently, and grieve it instead. If we can feel our pain and be very aware of those tempting automatic thoughts that lie to us and tell us there's an escape without consequence, maybe we can stave off some suffering.